game is to be where you are, be it honestly and as consciously as you know how. Watch the latest Ram Dass documentary film, Becoming Nobody, on Gaia.com. Of course, there was fear in losing that familiar identity. But there was always also wonder. The Gaia.com library supports you with transformational content. See it for yourself and go to Gaia.com slash Be Here Now and check out the Be Here Now playlist curated just for you. Visit Gaia.com slash Be Here Now and start your free trial today. I'm back with Mind Rolling, it's Raghu, and I'm back with John Lockley. And John, many of you know John. He's been here before. We've had some wonderful chats. And uh, and he just moved. For, he lives in South Africa, and he moved to Canada for a while. And I'm just like, wow, you're in my home country. How you doing, John? Good, Raghu. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, absolutely. Always a pleasure to chat. And um, of course, John said, how's it going down there? And I said, the United States is not so good as you can imagine. We have so many issues and so many problems, not the least of, of which, of course, is what we all have across this world, which is kind of making us united in a funny way, right? It's uh, the COVID uh, uh, be at one. -ness. For sure. COVID is bringing us all together. Yeah. It's a very strange thing, right? Mm. Very strange. So, uh, John and I have been talking, and we were talking about more particularly what's gone on since the George, George Floyd killing and what's going on in this country in a real, uh, shall we say, a renewal, a renewal of taking another look inside ourselves. Mm. I'm talking about white people here in this country. And we've been going through a lot as a foundation of... Uh, education and a lot of uh, back and forth with our brothers and sisters, uh, African-American and Latino and otherwise marginalized uh, Aborigine. And we, um, it's something that we do not want to just run under a bridge and the water is way down, you know, after the fact of the, of the atrocity, really. So uh, I was happy that uh, I had this conversation with John and uh, he mentioned, yeah, what we really need to do is decolonize the mind. So, That's uh, right. Yeah. So I'll just talk about that for a minute. And now uh, uh, for, for those of you who don't know, maybe we have to set the stage a little bit, John. Uh, sure. John lives in South Africa and um, is part of uh, a shamanistic tradition that uh, just give us a little bit of background of who you are that way before you get into the colonization of the mind. Yes, I'm from South Africa and I'm known as, a, as an Ikrecha, which is a traditional shaman, a traditional African shaman in the Krosa tribe. And the Krosa tribe is the tribe of Nelson Mandela. It's the mm. same tribe as Nelson Mandela. And uh, I was I was asked to become an apprentice of a, of a well-known medicine lady, Mam Gwevu, who became my teacher. And she asked me to join her just after part I broke because she had received some dreams. One dream in particular from the Great Spirit, she said, that said that she needed to train someone from another culture to become a Sangoma like herself. And then the next day I came through her gates and she said I was the one that she was called to train. And then she called me Utlingulandava, which means the messenger or bridge between cultures. And then I apprenticed with her for, for just on 10 years. And then they gave me the title of Likrichunkulu, which means senior Sangoma in the Krosa Nation. So it's a uh, highly it's an incredible unusual, journey. right? Yeah. Highly unusual. And I'm still the only man. only white guy in my in my village or my the township that I was trained. So it's a it's a very unusual position to be in, and uh, and I feel very blessed, and that's mm. why I'm I'm sharing some of my stories with you, Raghu. Mm, beautiful. Uh, and 
I actually really resonated with the decolonization of the mind, decolonizing the mind on so many different levels. Of course, not just uh, what we're speaking of right now, racial justice. Um, and I like to... Uh, I'd like to speak to the causes and conditions that create who we are by virtue of family, education, school, neighborhood, government, social structure. All of it contributes to who we are. And um, it contributes to the systemic... Uh, Racist, racism that lies at the core that is beyond thought. It's, it's mm. just an amazing thing. Now, some of the things we've gone through in terms of the education around the foundation has been, has been taking, uh, some of the primary thing is, gee whiz, talk about your upbringing. Who did you hang out with? What kind of school did you go to? And so much of, of this is just total ignorance and unrecognition of, of what it is to be a white person versus uh, an African-American person or in, you're in Canada. Uh, I, I just think that uh, we need to address the causes and conditions that create this story that we tell ourselves that either we are really upset around uh, neighborhoods that we might have lived in that had black folks in them, black, black families, or we, we are people that have lived so easily with black families and we are not racist and so on. Uh, so there's different causes and conditions that create this kind of story that we tell ourselves. And what what were you, what were the causes and conditions that created the story that you told yourself that was prevalent growing up in white South Africa? Well, it, it was really complicated because the the you know the main institution, which was apartheid government, was telling us the story that that blacks were communists, you know, and communism was seen as the enemy. And, uh, and that we had to do whatever we could to prevent communism from coming into South Africa. So there was a lot of, there was a lot of, yeah, it's, it's hard to even put it in a few words, but, but, um, yeah, black people were definitely seen as the other. Um, however, strange things used to happen as well. I mean, people also fell in love, you know, white and black people fell in love in all different forms and all different ways. and. I remember in my early days, my parents didn't want me to have an apartheid education. So my dad sent me to a private school because he said that one day apartheid's going to break. It's going to stop being the way it is. And he wanted me to be able to socialize in a normal way with people of different colors. So at my school, in my high school, I had boys of all different nations and different colors. So I was very lucky to to have not been brought up with a full curse of apartheid. Mm. However, when I left the school grounds, I would I would see the army trucks, I would see the police trucks, and I would see the, the victimization and oppression of black people. But it was really in the South African army that I that I started to learn. And and I was very lucky in the South African army that I was given the opportunity of becoming a medic. And in the in the medic uh, medical field I was given a chance to help rehabilitate soldiers, and the soldiers were mostly African um, special forces, black soldiers, and it was there that they started to teach me about the ways of African healing and the ways of ancestors. And, um, and it was incredible because everything I was taught about black people was wrong. And one thing was that black people are stupid. And I'm sorry to say that, but I'm just saying that's one of the prejudices. And I'm not saying that I internalized that or believed it. I'm just saying that's one of the things that was propagated in the government at the time. And I remember even as a boy thinking, how is it possible? Because the people I know in my vicinity can speak three, four different languages mm. and they are black people. 
whereas most white people can only speak um, maybe one or, or two languages at the best. So that was the first thing where I felt that there's something deeply wrong here that we are being fed, and I felt that as a child. And um, and then it went from there to a whole lot of other you know negative stereotypes, and I realized that what what it really spoke about was fear. People were really afraid of befriending um, African people, befriending black people because of power. So I felt at the root of this prejudice, the root of this this terrible oppression, was actually power and fear. And the the government at the time, the Nationalist Party or the Nationalist government in the 70s and 80s in South Africa, really wanted to hold on to that power. And the way they did that was in the age-old way of of oppression and negative stereotyping and actually instilling fear in the masses. And now we have a word called terrorism. And anyone you don't like, you call a terrorist. And it doesn't matter what color their skin is, people are going to get their guns and start pointing at them. So it's 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 the way we are fed information that we have to question. And I remember how it happened with me was I started to receive the dreams of calling to become a Sangoma. And then when my teacher invited me to become her apprentice, I went through this very powerful process in the township of questioning everything that I'd been taught and realizing that most of it by the mainstream was wrong. And also most of it had to do with power. Who has the power and where do they want to take the power from? And in my local area in the Eastern Cape, um, my friends were pushed into oppression because the, the land was taken from them by the English, by the English government, the English soldiers. And um, and the way they did what did that was through a process of of bringing in the Bible and bringing in the bullet and bringing the fear the fear of 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 if you don't do what we tell you then we're going to bring the army in so that's the bullet and then the other fear was if you don't listen to what we're saying then you're going to go to hell so my question was what was more damaging the pilots the 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 bullets or the Bible. And the Bible is a text, but it's how it's interpreted. So I don't want to go through a religious angle here. But the people did, a lot of damage happened in colonialism, not just through the physical uh, bullying tactics with the weapons, but also through a mental tactic of saying that the people were no good because they were following their ancestors and that they needed to follow the Western Christian God. And if they didn't, they were going to go to hell mm. because we know how to read the Bible mm. and the Bible is the word of God. So this was a very, very strong tactic that happened all through Africa and in particular in Southern Africa. Mm. And and we can take this back 500 years. Yes. Right? And so generationally, it just sets up a tremendous trauma for everybody concerned. And the people in power, I mean, you mentioned, you know, the root of it is power, ignorance, greed is in there big time. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, this, this is just uh, endemic to control, uh, certainly motivation, anyhow. Um, and I just need to add in there, Raghu, that everyone is affected by it. Everyone. I mean, I remember feeling such shame and guilt in being in the township as being the only white apprentice of my teacher mm. and feeling this heavy burden of, of responsibility because my father and family had benefited by apartheid because my father got a good job. And I remember asking one of my elders one day, I said to him, what was it like having all these white soldiers in the township walking amongst you with these semi-automatic guns? And uh, and his name and Krosa is Mtudozeli, which means the comforter, and he has an incredible dignity. And he looked at me with with such compassion. And I said to him, Father, I said, Tata, did you hate these soldiers? And he looked at me and he said, No, John, we never hated the soldiers because these were young white boys. Most of them were only 18 years old, and most of them had such fear in their eyes that we felt sorry for them. And he said, I realized, we all realized that both of us, white and black, were, had, were, were, were victims of oppression. 
And both of us had fear inside of us. And he said, these young white guys, most of them were just barely out of school. Mm. And now the people that were propagating this, in term, and specifically the British over those centuries, there, as His Holiness the Dalai Lama says, everybody wants to be happy, secure in their lives, mm. fulfilled. So then we start to think about these people and the stories that they told themselves. So they had to tell themselves a story that would m make this good in their mind somehow, That's the right, actions yeah. that they were taking. Yeah, because the actions were terrible. So they had to justify the oppression of, of the indigenous people. They had to justify it. And... Uh, like I say, when I was in the township, I mean, 20 years, I, I would feel often this terrible sense of guilt, you know, because of having white skin. And I remember one day, I mean, I can share this story because the story I want to share here is about healing, healing this terrible wound of colonization. And one of the ways we have to do that is through listening to people who have been terribly hurt. And one of my friends, um, one of my best friends actually, is a traditional healer, traditional Sangoma. And as it happens, he is actually related to one of the most famous prophets, Kosa prophets in South African history. And one day we sat together in township and he lives in a shanty town. He lives literally in, in this shack made with corrugated iron. And, uh, and he's so gifted, my young friend. And we were just sitting there and the wind was howling through the corrugated iron. And he looked at me and he just said, Tingo, Gogomoya, Tifunu Kukalela Wena, Ibale, Abazali Bam. He said, John, I want to share you the story of my people. And I said, Okay, Mshloba Wamok said, Okay, my friend. And then he told me how he was related to one of the top prophets in the Cross Nation. And then he told me how the English people came and stole their land and pushed them into the most terrible poverty you can imagine. And while he was telling me the story, Raghu, I, my whole body started to shake. And all I said to him, I interrupted him, Raghu, because I felt such shame and guilt and such mm -hmm. anger and mm -hmm. sadness. And I said, my parents are not responsible. My mother and father have done everything they can to combat racism and to help the people in our vicinity. They are good people. And I carried on like this. And he said, Peza, Tlingo, Peza. He said, stop, John. Just let me speak. And he said, I know your family are good people. And he said, and you are one of my best friends. In the funuku kalela, he says, I want you to, to just stop and just feel my heart and feel the suffering in my heart. Please, Tlingo. And I said, okay, Mshlobawam. And I just kept quiet and I just looked into his eyes and he spoke to me for another 10 minutes. And I just kept quiet. And afterwards, things changed because instead of fighting the trauma of what he was experiencing, instead of feeling that I am to blame and I'm responsible because I have white skin, I just let him speak and I allowed my heart just to feel his pain without trying to fix it, without trying to justify it, without trying to change it. I just had to feel his pain. And afterwards, things changed for me and for him. Mm. Wow. I mean, and I have, I have been feeling similar things as I've gone through talking to various people, you know, chats on podcasts, on mind rolling, or just informally and yeah i mean it's a very very tough thing because it's not like we didn't know of the pain and suffering this kind of thing like george floyd is the thing that wakes us up and that and other police brutality it needs that i guess it does need that it needs the fear that we're all going through around COVID, uh, the economic fear. Uh, I mean, it's a lot of things that built into one very powerful, traumatic, worldwide incident. And uh, 
Mm-hmm. I, uh, I I just want to mention this, John, because I was I was reading a, a book by a man named Thomas Hubel, uh, and uh, it's a, it's called a Healing Collective uh, Trauma. I'm not even sure if it's out yet. I'm probably going to do a podcast, but it was so um, so right on in terms of what you and I have been talking about since we decided to do this. Um, uh, he talks about the sociologists believe the trauma of slavery upon generations of African Americans has directly contributed to a legacy of social and economic disenfranchisement, police hostility, mass incarceration, and other forms of institutional racism faced by contemporary Black Americans. In many majority Black communities today, the symptoms of historical trauma are clearly evidenced. However, Rather than eliciting widespread understanding or compassion, their manifestations of depression, anger, substance abuse, etc., are still commonly used to justify racial resentments and policies of discrimination. Uh, the, The legacy of slavery and the subsequent disenfranchisement of black citizens has resulted in a deep and collective denial of the past on the part of many white Americans, as well as an inability or unwillingness to acknowledge their race-based privilege. And uh, this this is from a, a woman named Joy DeGuy, who's a PhD researcher and author of Post-Traumatic uh, Slave Syndrome. Uh, and she says, denial, repression, and disassociation operate on a social as well as an individual level. And I found that ring so true. And it rings all the way to people, you know, white liberals. So I would be that, you know, although I'm from Canada and and I had a little bit of a different upbringing related to people who were brought up in the States, but still pretty much the same. And we don't consider ourselves in any way racist and it can go on we all can go on about our friends that are we have black friends and and supported causes all of that bs and i call it mm-hmm. bs because we're not and this is one of the things i really learned we're not actively taking action to make the kind of change that's nece- necessary when you have this deep seated you know this this collective trauma from centuries and uh it's just totally turned my head around and in some cases i had what what you had which is i mean that deep listening you're talking about is Mm. so important and i'm glad you uh, mentioned that but certainly i can relate to to this experience that you have Mm. and i think we notice this in south africa that we have to be careful in order to heal racism We have to be careful with the language we use. And um, to heal racism, we have to be careful not about about using racist dialogue because it's no good to to replace one form of racism with another. So what would be really good and what we all really have to do is actually unite together, not divide amongst each other. And I think this is what this experience of George Floyd, I think, is teaching all of us that we have to, as Ram Dass says, we have to really love each other. And nature at the moment is suffering. And nature is suffering because human beings are fighting amongst each other. So we all have a responsibility on many different different levels to actually respect one another and respect our differences and be aware of those power plays that happen because power is, is beyond color of skin, although sometimes it can look like it's connected to the color of someone's skin, but it's much bigger than that. I remember before I did my first book launch of Leopard Warrior in America, it was the, it was in Portland and I was in a cafe and, you know, amazing things happen when you're traveling, Raghu, you know this, but anyway, I was in this cafe and I was a bit nervous about doing this, this first book launch in the United States. and. Um, and I ended up talking to this lovely man. He was an African-American man. And we ended up having this incredible conversation. And I shared that I'm from South Africa. I shared my background. And he looked at me with 
with a sense of earnestness inside of him and real truth. And he said, you know, John, all of us can be racist. Some people say, if you're black, you can't be racist. He says, it's not true. He said, all of us can be racist. And he said, racism, the only way we can fight it is just to love one another and respect one another and respect the differences that we have for each other. And, um, and I think, you know, as Nelson Mandela said, if they can teach you to hate, they can also teach you to love. So we were taught to hate in South Africa. That was what apartheid was based on. There was a lot of hate, and the background of the hatred was fear. And um, so Nelson Mandela, I mean, he's, he's got an incredible story. And just before he went to sleep one night in his cell when he was incarcerated, he had been in jail for about five years. And just before he went to sleep one night, there was this little voice that went off inside of him, and that little voice said to him, Nelson, Nelson, the hatred you feel inside of you is going to kill you. This anger inside of you is going to kill you. And then when he woke up the next morning, he said that voice said to him, you need to befriend the enemy. So the first thing he did was just have a conversation with his jailer, who was this young white guy. And he just asked him in a kind of a, he said in a bit of a rude way, but he said he was incarcerated and he was angry. And he said to him, what made you become a jailer? And he said, well, I didn't have a choice, he said. He says, what do you mean you didn't have a choice? Because in his mind, being a white guy, this guy had lots of choice. And the jailer said, well, my father died when I was 13, 14 years old, and I've got five brothers and sisters, and I had to get a living, earn a living to help my family because we were living on a farm. And in that moment, Nelson Mandela said he was shocked because it was the first time he'd ever heard of a white guy having less privilege than him. Because mm. Nelson Mandela, when his father, his father died when he was seven, he was invited into the royal family of the Cross Nation, and he was educated by the prince. So he had the best education that South Africa could, could, could provide because the prince was wealthy. So he said to this guy, he said, well, where was your farm? And he said, Eastern Cape. He said, I'm from the Eastern Cape. Oh, yes, has his crosser? We are Teddy's crosser? He says, do you know the crosser language? Can you speak the language? He says, he says, yes, I speak the language. Then the next thing, they started speaking in Nelson Mandela's own language. And later on, when Nelson Mandela became the president of South Africa, one of the people standing next to him was this white jailer who had become one of his closest friends. And he said later on that that experience of befriending the other got him to look at his own anger and hatred and to ask the question, is it true? Is it true that all white people are, are devils? <laughs> is it true that all white people have more privilege than him? All these questions he had to face. Mm. And it was a lesson in South Africa because we have to ask ourselves these questions all the time. Is it true that the other that we are angry with or that we throw our hatred on is, you know, is as we feel that they are, you yeah. know? So it was a lovely story. That yeah, time. great story, John. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Love that story. And it also points to what I was mentioning earlier about how much we believe in our individual stories as a result of the causes and conditions that, create that story and uh sometime um, so here's a here's a case where mandela heard this story of this young jailer mm. and through that deep listening he was it, it just it was an enlightening moment for him it sounds like and his ability to to do that of course was at the core of of who he, who he was. And uh, I think that that's such an important thing, our ability to be able to, to listen to other people's stories uh, so mm -hmm. that, that we are not putting them in that other category. It's, but it's, it's extraordinarily difficult. And it's kind of, uh, just go back a little bit. You mentioned, you know, Ramdas's thing of I mean Ramdas engaged in social action big time 
all over, you know, through the decades. And at the same time, it was a love everyone, all one, all of those, you know, very high minded spiritual concepts, which, which are as real as anything else. But in the case, and as I'm finding out, this can be used as a bypass to not do anything mm. because you're already there. You know, it's that, that thing that people do that we all do at one point or another, uh, especially getting on the spiritual path and that actions need to be taken is, uh, is so self-evident in, in relation to what's going on today. And, and sometimes it's just simple action. It's not just donating money to, which is important too, supporting black businesses, supporting black causes. That's important too. It's, uh, you know, the protests were full of, of, of people, of uh, white skinned people, full of them. That's important too. But sometimes it's just, to me, an individual thing of being able to sit down with somebody as you sat down with your, that friend and told that story. And he said, just listen, John, you know, mm -hmm. and it's just listen, each one of us. And that includes, uh, I have a, a great, uh, one day I'd love for you to to meet. Uh, her name is Valerie Carr. She just did a, a book uh, called See No Stranger. It's a, she's a Sikh woman and it's a, a book about a memoir and, and, and manifesto, she calls it. And she ended up in a situation where she, some very loud uh, people at a table next to her uh, and she was in the middle of writing this book. And they were speaking in horrific language about black people and their prejudice and racism was just wildly out front. And she could not not go as, a, you know, and she's a, 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 a small woman who was going to go over, deal with these big guys that, uh, that were espousing these horrific things. And she did it in a way that, they backed off and uh, four of the five of them left. And then the one guy that was there, actually, she sat down with and he said, I'm not a racist. My wife is Latina. I'm not a racist, but you know, I, I have these prejudices about black people. And he went on about that. And she was, totally blown away by the reality of it, but she was able to sit there and listen to his story. And behind his story, you, you can feel the causes and conditions of him growing up within this framework of racist, uh, racism. And it was just passed down. It's, you know, it, it takes us full circle into the decolonization of our minds and what we need to do even if we think we are clean, so to speak, I don't think that we are because this oppression has gone on for so long and it's become endemic in, in communities. Uh, it's just uh, what the government has done. And, uh, uh, so you can go on and on and on in this, uh, and tell that story in this country. But I just, that she was able to sit down and, and listen to this man just created one brief moment of openness, although it didn't change his obvious predilections. But that's something to do. It's very difficult, though, right? Yeah, very difficult, I can imagine. Wow. And, um, I mean, we see with Nelson Mandela, I mean, one of the things that he did when he became president, he wanted to have a meeting with... The Hendrik Vervoet's wife, and Hendrik Vervoet was the guy that was the architect of apartheid. And everyone said, well, why are you doing this? And he said, well, you know, he needs to, he needs to meet, you know, he needs to meet the, the, the widow, you know, of the man who started apartheid. And, um, and everyone thought that Hendrik Vervoet's wife wasn't going to meet Nelson Mandela. And of course she did. And they show the two of them having cups of tea together and talking. And I think, I think that's it, just sitting together and talking. And then I recall another story of how Nelson Mandela spoke with the Youth League of the Palestinians and, and of the Israelis. 
And they sat together and spoke to him and they said, how did you do it, uh, Mr. Mandela? How did you bring peace to the country? And he said, well, you know, every day me and F.W. de Klerk would speak together and we'd discuss what's happening in South Africa. And we would argue and we would shout and we would have um, disagreements. But at the back of all of this, we knew that there was so much going on, much bigger than just ourselves and our own personal disagreements, that if we didn't make peace, that there was going to be war and our communities and our families and our friends would get terribly hurt. So we had to come together and we had to respect one another. And each day as we left, we would shake hands, no matter what the conversation entailed, no matter how angry we got with each other, we would shake hands. And each morning when we met again, we would shake hands and start again. And it's almost like with martial arts. In karate, you bow to your opponent, and at the end you bow. And this is the rule of combat. And he said to these two young people, the, the, the head of the Palestinian Youth League and the head of the Israeli Youth, Youth League, he said, if you disrespect your opponent, everything is over. He said, I learned in my dealings with F.W. de Klerk that we had to respect each other, which meant listening to each other's viewpoints, even though we might not agree with one another. So I think, I think that's what it boils down to, you know, all the minority groups in the world who don't have the power of, let's say, white privilege or, or white people or, or Western colonized people, we have to learn to listen to one another because that's our strength as human beings, is mm -hmm. we have to learn to listen to all the colors of humanity because that's the way you're going to become stronger. Yeah. And we should talk about, yeah, we go back to decolonizing our, our minds. And, and we talked about it before around the triggers are really powerful mm. uh, on all levels and uh, yeah, around the prejudice. And but the shadows that are there are um, very, very pernicious because they grab us in a way that is so deep gut level emotional. So, uh, you know, and I know we've talked and you've talked about uh, becoming, um, I mean, radical self-inquiry, which is, uh, I mean, I love the whole self-inquiry methodology from Ramana Maharshi in India, that great saint. And I think that's really part of how we can get at uh, decolonizing the mind, because until we understand our minds, we how do we just don't know even where to start, and so uh, self radical self inquiry and um, and the and the we we talk a lot about inner activism. Ramdas has talked about inner activism needs to happen alongside of social action, outer action. They both have to happen at the same time. You can't wait until you become enlightened. At the same time, you recognize that as much anger as you bring to any situation. Uh, is going to have the count. It's, it's just a counter effect. It's going to have the opposite effect of what it is that you're looking to change. So, talk a little bit about from your tradition, the um, how how we approach that decolonization. Well, I think we need to listen to the inner voice inside of us, and that inner voice for us comes through in dreams. We need to listen to what our dreams are saying to us. Um, and then being a spiritual person is also about becoming a warrior. And being a warrior means to listen to those voices of sadness and grief and shame and guilt, all these voices we need to listen to. But what a lot of people do is when we feel those darker voices, we need to find someone to blame. So we throw it on our government or on our teachers or on the people who are seen as having less power than ourselves, which in the case of apartheid South Africa was black people. And it became an easy scapegoat, you know. But eventually we have to face ourselves and we have to face our own shadows. And one of the ways we do it, like I say, in the traditional area of being a Sangoma is looking at the dreams and what are the dreams mm. saying? What is that voice inside of us saying? And then we would also speak. So the action of speaking would be speaking to your teacher, 
and sharing the dream. And if it was something a little bit more important, let's say it was involved with the community, and in my case, it was shame and guilt that I was experiencing because of apartheid and being the only white person. So that's what I did. I sat with my teacher and I said, Mama, did you call her? I said, Mother, I want to say sorry on behalf of all the white people who have treated you and your family wrong. And did you call her? I'm sorry. And I said, I want to speak on the ancestral land and the kraal. I want to speak to all the people and do a reconciliation ceremony. And she said, okay, you can do that. Because part of the culture is when something serious happens, you gather together in what we call the kraal, which is basically the sacred land outside the home where all the cattle are kept. So it's a bit similar to the Hindu tradition of honoring the cattle. In Africa or Southern Africa, we honor the cattle as a sign of wealth, but we also honor them spiritually. So to speak to the ancestors or the great spirit, we would stand where the cattle stand, and then we would speak our hearts, and we would speak to the community. So this is the, one of the things that people would do, and this is what they did during apartheid. They would use their voices, and they would sing, and they would dance, and they would express to one another and to the wisdom keepers, the ancestors, what is happening and the injustice that they were facing. So I asked my teacher if I could speak on the holy land and the kraal and um, and is this share. When you, sorry, is it to interrupt? But is this when you first came uh, came into participating in the tradition? yes? Well, it wasn't straight away. It was probably um, after about five years or six years, just before I became a before I finished my training. I, I was. Each time I went into the township, I'd feel, feel this weight of, a, of oppression in terms of guilt, and I had to express it. So all the dreams, all the feelings inside, I had to express. So in traditional African culture, we express what we are feeling. We don't bottle it up. We use our voice. We talk to someone. We dance. We sing. We express the injustice or the pain of what we're feeling in our hearts. And we feel that when you do that, that's how your heart gets energy and that's how your spirit gets energy. So my teacher said to me one day, Kunjani, she said, how are you? And I said, Ndivo Pshlungu. I said, I'm feeling pain. She said, Ngoba, why? And I said, because I feel this guilt and shame and being a white person when everyone is suffering around me. And she looked at me with compassion and she said, Abanya Abantu, Basabenza Kakubi, Haibonke. She said, Some white people behave terribly, not all white people. And then she said, Some black people behave terribly towards other black people, but not all black people. So she said, Abanya Abonke. She said, some white people in the human race treat other people in a terrible way, but not all people are bad. She said, don't feel bad about the color of your skin because you and your family are not responsible. And I said, I said, yes, mother, I understand, but I want to speak to the community. So she said, okay. So then I went, we went into to her family kraal or her family land and we gathered all the elders and then I spoke and I prayed in Khosa and then I said to them, because this was resting on my heart so strongly, I said, on behalf of my people, on behalf of all the people I know, on behalf of all the white people I know, I'd like to say sorry. I said, I'm sorry for the way that, that you were treated by white people. I'm sorry for the colonizers and for the way your land was taken. And I said, on behalf of all these white people and all these ancestors, I need to say I'm sorry. And I need to say that they behaved in these ways because of ignorance, because they didn't know how beautiful you all are. And then I cried. Mm. And I said, I said, I'm sorry. And afterwards, the elders spoke. And then afterwards, I went to another part of the community in the rural areas, which was represented by my teacher's clan. And I did the same thing. And then we sat down later, and my teacher said, 
thank you. Diabola elektringo lindaba. I thank you, John, for sharing your heart and making this action of reconciliation. Mm. Mm. But now you don't need to do this anymore. You've said this, mm. and I've accepted it. Diavuma. You don't need to do it again. You need to stand tall the way you are meant to stand and speak from your people the way you are meant to speak. But right now, you are not just a white guy. You are also my adopted son, and you are also Kosa. You are an adopted Kosa man. Mm, beautiful. I just wish we had any kind of related model where we could speak to this the way that you did. And of course, the karma of you having this opportunity, this is not nothing out of the blue uh, mm -hmm. that uh, you were invited into the circle and became who you are today. Yet, so you had such a, an extraordinary opportunity, but you took the action, John, and that seems to be somewhat of what's lacking with people that are getting educated at this point and trying to think of what's the what's the way that they can make country we 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 can make a contribution such as this where uh, it 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 would help heal a gigantic rip and i'm not ta i'm talking about people who are conscious and quote unquote spiritual and still have trouble finding a way to speak the way uh, you just described this. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping, I mean, this is some of the work that we are trying to do is create more forums where that can take place. And I guess that's, uh, we, we do the best we can to make that happen. But that's all of what I'm talking about around taking action, individual actions, the deep listening action and the, and the action of expressing what you expressed, the, the sorrow for this pain. So, right And I think the next thing, you know, some kind of action uh, needs to happen in terms of um, making monuments, you know, and, and shrines and poems and songs to people who have been brutalized. Um, I mean, when I first came to America, I need to share this with you, actually, Raghu, um, a lot of people didn't want to hear me say this, but now after what's happened to George Floyd, I think I can say this. But when I first came to America, I used to get a lot of visions of blood in the land. And I went to various places and I would see lots of blood. And I'd have these dreams of North American Indian people coming to me in tatters with blood on their faces. And um, and I remember, I remember speaking to to various people and saying that in order to heal the land and also heal the people, these ancestors of the land, these North American Indian ancestors who have been brutally treated, they need to be honored and they need to, we need to have songs and monuments and poetry sung to them. And also when it's, when it's required, there needs to be reconciliation ceremonies. And I said, because if this doesn't happen, America will never heal. It will always have the energy of warfare on it. And it's been over 500 years of warfare. And unless we acknowledge the ancestors of the land who have been, who have been terribly treated, first North American Indian people, and then um, African American people who, through slavery, I, you know, you, we need to address the first wound, which is the terrible genocide of indigenous people in North America. And it's not to point fingers and say this person's to blame, that person's to blame, but just to feel that wound and feel that pain and then bring in the families of those people who are still alive and just say, we as a nation are sorry for what happened to your family and we would like to sit together and have a song or a prayer or a monument or something to honor your people who have died in such terrible ways. But you know, Raghu, not one group of people wanted, wanted to listen to me. Mm. When I said this, and I said, I come from South Africa. I come from the truth and reconciliation culture that unless you face the wound of the past, it's going to haunt you, haunt you with the energy of violence and anger. Yeah. 
Yeah. But no one wanted to listen to me. That was about eight years ago. Yeah, that's because we don't have any container for this whatsoever. We have no containers for so much of uh, uh, how we how we grow up within a family structure which has been completely splintered. We have no container. We have no container for a young man growing up and going through the kind of, if we look back at the rituals of, of our family, forefathers, which to me is, you know, the Native Americans, they had a, a ritual. There was a way in which a young man, I'm speaking of a young man, because if they go uh, astray, that becomes hugely difficult for everybody. And so they had, uh, there was a, a matriculation of a soul entering into adulthood that had form and tradition and a container to be able to do the kinds of things that, that you're speaking of. And, uh, but we need to create it. And it's yeah. not difficult to create. I mean, you're already creating a container, Raghu, with your podcast. That's a container. It's a voice. It's where people sit and feel the truth of things and sit together. That's the container. And you can start it off with some prayers and, and you already do that. Even if you don't do it verbally, you, you in the, you in the school and lineage of Ramdas, and all those prayers are being held uh, held with you. So any any community setting where people come together in a conscious way to do good and give the voice to others and acknowledge the pain of the past, that's what is needed. Yeah. It doesn't and, have to be a fancy system. Yeah, uh, and uh, and in truth, what we have brought from India in our tradition is the ability and the importance of getting together in community, sangha, satsang, whatever you want to call it, and being able to share just in the ways that we're talking. And, and we, we, of course, are bringing that in. Now it's all online, but uh, uh, it, we, we certainly have, uh, have started that. We are, uh, the intention is there. The actualization is starting to happen. So... But I guess I'm just lamenting just the way that uh, mm. we we grew up, me in particular. I mean, all I ended up with as a rebellious teenager was like, what the hell is going on? I don't want to know. And it was, you know, how can I? It's just anger expression is really what I went through until psychedelics and meeting Ram Dass and going off to India. But, yeah, but I mean, I think you have to realize that you're doing something extraordinary. You are doing something. You're giving a voice to people. And that in itself is one of the strongest medicines there is. And that's what I learned from the Cross Nation. I mean, Nelson Mandela is one of the strongest orators in Africa. And the reason how I became like that is because of the culture and because the way he was trained in the Cross culture. And they're incredible orators and their oratory ability is about speaking from the heart and sharing the pain in their heart. And I think this is what you're doing with this podcast and also with the Love Serve Remember Foundation of bringing people together in community to share from their hearts. And when, it, then when there's a sharing of truth and also when you're sharing shadow stuff, things that people don't really want to talk about like mm. racism, yeah. and then bringing people who have been oppressed and giving them a chance to speak their truth and everyone listen, I think that's how things start to really change yeah. in a major way. Yeah, yeah. Man. Thank you for that, actually. Um, last but not least, before we have to go, I mean, we speak of, uh, and we have been speaking of just, uh, well, just before we got on, how's it, how is it for you all here in, in the United States? And how difficult it is. So many different, in so many different areas. Um, there can be an overwhelm that happened and there is one going on and uh i think of resilience we actually have uh, a uh, a virtual retreat coming up to replace what we were going to do in maui it actually was spring and then it went to august and we had to cancel it because of uh, obvious reasons uh, so we thought well what should the theme of this be and the theme is uh, one of the themes uh, actually, the, the main theme is Wise Hope, which is Roshi Joan Halifax. Is, uh, uh, she wrote a beautiful paper around it. hope on its own 
is an ex, has expectations of nice results. <laughs> Wise hope is much more spacious and includes the that uh, uncertainty and change and uh, impermanence is part of it. So, uh, but resilience was the other part, and mm. um, resilience can be difficult because resilience. I'm going to be, boy, I'm going to hang in there. You know, you're going to hang in there. That kind of, that's a, a very tight fisted, um, not pliable perspective. So, uh, we, so we're talking about loving resilience, which emanates from what Ramdas called loving awareness. So we're coming from there. We're not coming from the I ought to and I got to place. It's from, again, that more spacious place within us that can allow for both of the, you know, what do they call 100,000 horrible visions, 100,000 beautiful visions. Mm. And so, but resilience is is very much on my mind lately. And, and that's why we thought this would be a, a great uh, theme. It, by the way, the retreat, everybody, is at August 28th through 30th and join ramdas.org mailing list so you'll get an email about it. Um, but in your, in your mind, John, I mean, this is, this is very difficult, very difficult worldwide, very, very difficult to, to be resilient and, and to deal with fear and to deal with the polarizations and, uh, the prejudices and so on. Um, how, how do you, uh, manage to fuel your resilience in a way that's not I ought to? I think the first thing we need to see is that what's happening is correct. It's all about the healing of the world and the healing of humanity because these um, these various groups of people have been disenfranchised and treated terribly for too long. So this coronavirus is bringing up the shadow of humanity and and through that, we need to look at all these issues inside ourselves. So through adversity, we build strength. So one of those things that I just need to share with the listeners that through these tough times, just be careful about the inner critic and blaming yourself and trying to become perfect. Because what the world needs is not perfect people. What the world needs is, is human beings that have the ability to feel pain and joy and just be honest. The world is not looking for perfect human beings. Mm. And earlier on, you were talking about spiritual bypass. And often, what does that talk about is, is, this, is this search for, for perfection. And part of feeling the grit and grime of the human race is actually to accept that there is a shadow and there is darkness, but you're not making an opinion about it. You're just accepting that this is part of the human race, but doesn't mean that you're going to act out in a dark way, but you need to feel these energies and then do a prayer, um, offer a, a candle or some, or some, um, or a flower to the sea or do some little ritual to deal with your pain and to call on hope and call on joy, but be very, very careful of the inner critic and do not beat yourself up during these times. Mm. If you feel that there's something inside of you that you want to ask for forgiveness, like I felt in South Africa because of my white skin, then go and do it. Go and go to, you say, a home of, of someone or a North American Indian person or and go and put some flowers down on the grave of, of, of someone who's lost their life in a terrible way. Go and make some kind of action and then let it go and just be aware of that inner critic because sometimes the inner critic can be our biggest um, opponent, not necessarily the person outside, but inside ourselves. Watch that inner critic and then offer it some hot chocolate, some candy, a prayer, something like that, and then do your best. If you feel that you need to do something with your voice and your body and help someone or go and offer a some food to a homeless person, then go and do that and write out that voice inside of you if the inner critic is strong and then make an offering to it with something beautiful and be kind to yourself. Be kind to yourself because if you, if you give in to that inner critic and say that you're a bad person, da, 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 is that the truth? 
No, it's not the truth. Yeah. Yeah. So this is where the work starts. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. So it's like a vision quest, what the world's going through with this incredible pandemic and all the pain and suffering that's coming with it is like a shamanic vision quest. And often it involves some kind of adversity. Often it involves some kind of physical and psychological pain. And often it also involves prayer and calling on the other world to give us strength. And this is the missing piece that a lot of people need to bring in with their practice. And it's mm. something that you do and love, serve, remember in terms of chanting and practice. Yeah. Thank you, John. I'm so glad to hang out with you as usual. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I feel our tribe. I feel our tribe for sure. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I wish one day I could come visit you and I'd love to to come into the community and, and just spend a, a, a moment with you. And I'm sure one day that'll happen, actually. And uh, we're going to put, uh, yeah, John um, has a couple of great books. And uh, we're going to put all of that in the show notes and links to, uh, I guess, at this point, you must be doing online stuff as well. Yes, just webinars. Yeah, so uh, we'll link you to John's website and you'll be able to take part in them. I mean, uh, talk about a, a, a very refreshing perspective. John gives very refreshing. So thank you for being here. Thank you so much, John. And uh, we will, uh, how long are you going to be in Canada? I'm not sure. Um, you may uh, never get out, though. If, <laughs> I don't know. know how long I'll be here <laughs> because it's so difficult with the corona and, and yeah. traveling. So I know. Uh, Once just, you're there, you're there. You're going to be there for I'm a while. Here. <laughs> oh, well, let's see what happens. But uh, we shall speak to you sooner than later, I am sure. This is Mind Rolling on Be Here Now Network. Go to BeHereNowNetwork.com and uh, check out all the other podcasts. Uh, we have just absolutely wonderful uh, folks that are thought leaders and teachers that uh, are worth checking out. And uh, we will catch you next week. Thanks again. Thank you.